Welcome. Happy Lord's Day, dear. <clears throat> okay, this is going to be Lecture 3, CFW Walther's The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. Lecture 3. And then here's the work. Uh, 450 pages. It's a massive tome. Uh, and you can get it for only $13 at cost, I believe. You go to Amazon, $13. It's Pastor, uh, 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 Pastor Doctor Jordan Cooper, uh, Justin Sinner. Uh, dot com, I believe, and he has um, an excellent YouTube website. He puts this out. He he did this reprint at cost, I believe, thirteen dollars um, for this uh, for this work. And so, I would actually encourage you to check out Jordan Cooper on YouTube. There's a lot of inter introductory stuff on Lutheranism, and he does a lot of other stuff, conference speaking, delving uh, deeper into theological and biblical studies. But I'm going to give the link as well to, um, or the link I should say, to a copy of this you can read online. It's an older version, but still it does the trick. And... And... Uh, this work here, out of the hundreds of works that I have and on my laptop, PDFs, I have uh, a few hundred of the PDF books, if you can believe it, um, just on the computer. This this would be my top top five. If I had to choose five books um, to take out of my library, it would be, this would be one of them. And as he stated in the first lecture, this doctrine is of such importance, and Lutherans recognize this, um, next to the foundational doctrine of justification, this follows right on the heels of it, the proper distinction of law and gospel. We need to have an understanding of this, and people misunderstand what, what is meant by law and gospel distinction. Um, people don't real, realize that when when we speak of law, we're not just speaking of the Ten Commandments in particular, but whatever... God demands in Scripture. Then the gospel is whatever His promises are. So with that being said, let's get into His second evening lecture, uh, September 19th, 1884. A person may pretend to be a Christian, while in reality he is not. As long as he is in this condition, he is quite content with his knowledge of mere outlines of Christian doctrines, Everything beyond that, he says, is for pastors and theologians to perceive as clearly as possible everything that God has revealed that is something in which a non-Christian has no interest. However, the moment a person becomes a Christian, there arises in him a keen desire for the doctrine of Christ. Even the most uncultured peasant who is still unconverted is suddenly roused in the moment of his conversion, and begins to reflect on God and heaven, salvation and damnation, etc. He becomes occupied with the highest problems of human life. An instance of this kind is afforded by the Jews who flocked to Christ, and also by the apostles. Those multitudes heard Christ with great joy and were astonished because, of, because he preached with authority. And not as the scribes, but the majority of those hearers never advanced beyond a certain feeling of delight and admiration. Two, the apostles too were uneducated people, but they acted differently. They did not stop where the rest stopped, but propounded all manner of questions to Christ. After hearing one of the parables, they said, Declare unto us the parable. Matthew 6, 13, verse 36. Similar to this was the conduct of of the Bereans who search the scriptures daily. Acts 17.11 It is therefore quite true what the Apology says. The Apology um, to the Augsburg Confession uh, by Melanchthon. Men of good conscience are crying for the truth and proper instruction from the Word of God. Even as death, even death is not as bitter to them as when they find themselves in doubt regarding the matter or this matter or that. Accordingly, they must seek where they can find instruction. 
uh, Mueller, page uh, 191, and that would be Mueller's dogmatic theology, I think. He's got something in Latin here. Uh, Serving to obtain the truth and divine assurance is a necessary criteria already of an or ordinary Christian. In still higher degree, however, in the case of a theologian. A theologian has not the greatest interest in the Christian doctrines is unthinkable. Even where there is but the beginning of faith in the heart, a person regards no point of doctrine as trifling, and every doctrine is to him as precious as gold, silver, and rubies. God grant that this may be your case. If it is, you will not come uh, you will not come uh, into these lectures, but will ask again and again, What is truth? Not in the spirit of Pilate, but of Mary, who sat at Jesus' feet and listened rapidly to every word he spoke. Then, too, every one of these lectures will be of great blessing to you, even though the instrument through which the truth is to be conveyed to you is inferior. Now, the first matter that you are to consider is the points of difference between these two doctrines, the law and the gospel. We have heard that there are six points of difference, four of which we have reviewed. Let us pass on to the fifth point. The fifth point of difference between the law and the gospel concerns the effects of these two doctrines. What is the effect of the preaching of the law? It is threefold. In the first place, the law tells us, this is the, the, uh, the, the three uses of the law, it is threefold. In the first place, the law tells us what to do, but does not enable us to comply with its commands. It rather causes us to become more unwilling to keep the law. True, some treat the law as if, if it were a rule in arithmetic. However, let the law once force its way into a person's heart, and that heart will strain with all its force against God. The person will become furious at God for asking such important things of him. Yea, he will curse God in, the, in his heart. He would slay God if he could. He would thrust God from his throne if it were possible. The effect of preaching the law, then, is to increase the lust for sinning. In the second place, the law uncovers to man his sins, but offers him, to, offers him no help to get out of them, and thus hurls him into despair. In the third place, the law does indeed produce contrition. It conjures up the terrors of hell, of death, of the wrath of God, but it has no drop of comfort to offer the sinner. If no additional teaching besides the law is applied to man, he must despair and die, and perish in his sins. Ever since the fall, the law can produce uh, no other effects in man. Let us produce this well. This is what we see from Romans 7, 7 through 9, where Paul relates his personal experience under the law. Thus, I have not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking the occasion by the commandment, commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. But when the law came, sin revived. No heathen knows that even evil lust in the heart is sin. The greatest moralists have said, It is not my fault that I sin. I cannot help it. I cannot prevent myself from sinning. But the law shouts, Thou shall not covet. Thou shall not lust. Yet we are told that we must be free even from inherited lust. While a person gives no thought to the law, sin goes in and out at his heart, and he is not conscious of sinning. Ask a worldly person about this matter, and he will be surprised and say, Hey, I have done no evil, I have slain no one, I have committed, I have not committed adultery, I have not been a thief, etc. He is not noticing at all that sin is, const, is a constant guest with him. I like that. He is not noticing at all that sin is a constant guest with him. But when the law strikes him like a bolt of lightning, he preserves how great a sinner he is. Catch that now. What horribly ungodly thoughts he is cherishing. 
That is what the apostles, apostle means when he said, says, sin revived. When the law came, the law uncovers sin, but offers us no comfort. If we had the law only, as we have it now, and nothing besides, we, sh we should have to perish forever and go to hell. The smiting effects and the curse of the divine law will first be felt in hell, for the law must be fulfilled, it must be ver preserve its divine authority. Take 2 Corinthians 3, 6, where we read, The letter killeth. The apostle calls the, the law the letter, because God has inscribed in it the form of letters upon the tablets of stone. Even pagans have observed that the law produces in an effect opposite to that which it commands. The statement of the prolific uh, poet uh, Ovid is well known. Uh, and, uh, the Latin phrase, we strive after the forbidden thing and always lust after, lust after those things which are denied us. O Ovid himself was a swine, and he was and he says bluntly, See, this is how I do. I always do those things which others regard as forbidden. When the Israelites at Mount Sinai were given the Ten Commandments, they were all a tremble. Their natural behavior revealed the condition of their hearts. On that occasion, God wanted to point to us for all time to come. Behold, this is the effect of the law. Accordingly, when the rich young man came to Christ, important point here, when the rich young man came to Christ asking how he might be saved, and was so utterly blind that he did not at all perceive his sinful corruption, we are told he went away sorrowful, Matthew 19, 22. Christ could not yet apply the gospel to this young man. He first had to convince him that he was utterly incapable of fulfilling the law. This lecture is very important, very important. Again, when Paul preached to Felix, the governor, concerning righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come, we read that Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for you. Uh, Acts 24, 25. But he never called for Paul again. He wanted to be rid of the thunder and lightning of the law. Again, when Peter, on the first Christian festival of Pentecost, had preached the law to the hearers, we are told that they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do, namely to be saved? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The effects of the gospel are of an entirely different nature. Now, now here we're getting into a, a shift from the law, now we're getting into the gospel. The effects of the gospel are of an entirely different nature. They consist in this, that in the first place, the gospel, when demanding faith, offer and gives us faith in that very demand. When we preach to people, do, do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God gives them faith through our preaching. That's important. We preach faith. And any person not willful, resistant, not willfully resistant, obtains faith. It is indeed not the mere physical sound of the spoken word that produces this effect, but the contents of the word. The second effect of the gospel is that it does not at all reprove the sinner, but takes all terror, all fear, all anguish from him and fills him with peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. At the return of the prodigal, the father does, does not, with a single word, refer to his horrible, abominable conduct. He says nothing, nothing whatever about it, but falls upon the prodigal's neck, kisses him, and prepares a splendid feast for him. That is a glorious parable exhibiting to us the effect of the gospel. It removes all unrest and fills us with the blessed and heavenly peace. In the third place, the gospel does not require anything good that man must furnish. Not a good heart, not a good disposition, no improvement on his condition, no godliness, no love either of God or man. It issues no orders, but it changes man. It plants love in his heart and makes him capable of all good works. 
It demands nothing, but gives it all, but gives all. Should not this fact make us leap for joy? The effects of the gospel are exhibited to us in Acts 16 in the case of the jailer of Philippi. He asked Paul, now get this now, compare this to the rich young ruler we just talked about, that thought he kept the law all his life, Christ pressed the law on his heart, and he went away sorrowful because, he, because the law did not break him. The, the law did not slay him. Now compare that to the jailer at Philippi here. The effects of the gospel are exhi exhibited to us in Acts 16 in the case of the jailer of Philippi. He asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And received this answer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The jailer does not say to the apostles, How am I going to do this? Oh, how, am, how am I to go at this? No, he promptly believes, for the apostle's word has spoken faith in his heart. The story concerning him goes on immediately. He rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Observe that the gospel bestows faith which it demands. In the demand for faith, there is nothing of the nature of the law. It is the demand of love. The difference between the rich young ruler, he thought he kept the law. This man here didn't need law. The rich young ruler needed law pressed upon his heart to be broken by it. The rich young ruler asked what he must do to be saved. He was already broken by the law. That's why Paul didn't preach law to him. There's a difference. Certain people are prepared for the gospel. They're, they're, they're already broken by the law. Certain people aren't, so they need the law pressed on them. They, they don't need the gospel at that point. Romans 1, 16. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, believeth. Here we have a record of something glorious. Can there be anything more glorious, more beautiful, more blessed, more precious than what the gospel gives us? Eternal life? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We have a brief description of the gospel as seen in its effects. The apostles, apostle says, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, ordained that we should walk in them. The gospel does not say you must do good works, but it fashions me into a human being, into a creature of such, kind as cannot but serve God and his, and his fellow man. Verily, a precious effect. To the renegade, Galatians, Paul appears, Galatians 3, 2, saying, This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of law or by the hearing of faith? Of course, they had to answer. It was through the preaching of faith which we heard, and that we were given a new heart. For prior to that, we could not do good. We have, we have been made over into new creatures. You do not have to tell the sun to shine, and it would be just as useless to say to one, say to one of those new creatures, you must do this or that. Finally, there is a sixth point of difference between the law and the gospel. It relates to the persons to whom either doctrine is to be preached. This is what I talked about a minute ago. Uh, the, the rich young ruler and the jailer at Philippi. It relates to persons to whom either doctrine is to be preached. In other words, there is a difference in the subjects of whom it, they must be applied. The persons on, on whom either doctrine is to operate and the end for which it is to operate are utterly different. The law is to be preached to secure sinners in the gospel. The law is to is preached to secure sinners in the gospel to alarm sinners. In, a, in other respects, both doctrines must indeed be preached, but at this point the question is, what are the persons to whom the law must be preached rather than the gospel, and vice versa? Very important. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. Paul writes, We know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous man, 
but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary, contrary to sound doctrine. To all persons of this description, then, the law only is to be preached, and they are not to have a drop of the gospel. As long as a person is at ease in his sins, as long as he, unwilling, he is unwilling to quit some particular sin, so long only the to quit some particular sin, so long only the law, which curses and condemns him, is to be preached to him. However, the moment he has become frightened at his condition, the gospel is to be promptly administered to him. For from that moment on, he is no longer to be classified with secure sinners. Accordingly, when the devil holds you in a single sin, you are not yet a proper subject for the gospel to operate upon. Only the law must be preached to you. A prophetic utterance of our Lord prior to his incarnation was cited by him afterwards in the days of his flesh. Luke 4, 16-21. It is found in Isaiah 61, 1-3. Thy spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Uh, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the pris prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes and oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of of heaviness. The day of vengeance of our God in this uh, text is the judgment which God is to execute upon hell and the devil. Can there be a more glorious message than this? The devil has horribly disfigured the human race and hurled men into deep distress. Christ has avenged this. He is proclaimed to the devil, I have conquered thee, and men created after the image of God shall not be lost. I have procured salvation for them. Only those who perish, who absolutely refuse to be saved, for God coerces no one in this manner. Now to such poor, sad-hearted sinners, I repeat, not a word of law must be, must be preached. Woe to the preacher who would continue to preach the law to a famished sinner. On the contrary, to such a person, the preacher must say, Do but come. There is still room. No matter how great a sinner you are, there is still room for you. Even if you were a Judas or a Cain, there is still room. Oh, do. Do come to Jesus. Persons of this kind are proper subjects of whom the gospel is to operate. Let us now cite to you a passage from Luther's sermon on the distinction between law and gospel. Uh, I would encourage you to look that up online. Um, uh, Luther's, uh, just type in Luther's sermon on the distinction between law and gospel. Uh, he writes, quote, By the term law, nothing else is to be understood than a word of God that is a command that enjoins upon us that we are to do and that we are to shun. That requires from us some work of obedience. This is easily understood when we look only at the form of speech in which God express, expresses a certain word. If this, in causa for, formula, but it is very difficult in the execution, in causa in uh, finula. Now, butchering the Latin, I, I don't know Latin. There are many kinds of laws or commands that refer to the works which God requires of each person individually. According to his natural disposition, his standing in society, his office, and according to, 
according to the particular season and other circumstances that have a bearing on the doing such good works. Hence, the commandments tell each man what his natural disposition and his office. For instance, a wife must tend her children and let the master of the house do the governing. That is the task required of her. A servant is to obey his master and do other things which it behooves a servant to do. In like manner, a maid servant has a law to govern her conduct. However, the universal law that pertains to all of us is this, Matthew twenty two thirty nine: Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Give him advice and aid in any emergency. If he is hungry, feed him. If he is naked, clothe him, and so on. This is properly this is properly delimit, delimiting the law and sequestering it from the gospel. Law is to be called and to be anything that refers to what we are to do. On the other hand, the gospel or the creed is any doctrine or word of God which does not require works from us and does not command us to do something, but bids us simply simply accept as a gift the gracious forgiveness of our sins and everlasting bliss offered to us. In accepting these gifts, we are surely uh, we surely are not doing anything. We are merely we merely receive. We merely suffer to be given to us. What is given and presented to us by means of the word. As when God gives you a promise, law, gospel, law, promise, command, promise, like this, I make thee a, I make thee a present of this or that. For instance, in holy baptism, which, uh, which I have not ordained and which is not my work, but the word and work of God. He says to me, come hither, I baptize thee and wash thee from all thy sins. Accept this gift and it shall be thine. Now, when you are thus baptized, what else do you do than receive and accept a precious gift? Now, this is important here. We're getting to a couple of important points here. The difference then between law and gospel is this. Check this out. The difference then between the law and the gospel is this. The law makes demands of things that we are to do. It in, insists on works that we are to perform in the service of God and our fellow man. In the gospel, however, we are summoned to a dis, uh, distribution of rich alms, which we are to receive and take, the love, kindness of God, and eternal salvation. Here's an easy way of is, illustrating the difference between the two. In offering us help and salvation as a gift, in donation of God, the gospel bids us to hold the sack open and have something given to us. The law, however, gives nothing, but only takes and demands things from us. Now these two, giving and taking, are surely far apart. For when something is given me, I am not doing anything towards that. I only receive and take. I have something given to me. Again, when in my profession I carry out commands, likewise when I advise and assist my fellow men, I receive nothing but give to another whom I am serving. Thus the law and the gospel are distinguished as to their formal statements. The one promises, the other commands. The gospel gives us and bids us to take the law demands and says, this you are to do. We note that Luther does not develop this doctrine in scientific fashion, but he proclaims it like a prophet. This is why he makes such a great impression. He has written a scientific treatise in Latin on this subject with a systematic divisions and subdivisions marked A, uh, A, A, N, B, A, N, etc. The people would have marveled and said, that man is a great scholar, but he would not but he would not by this method have made impression made the impression which he did make. In the writings of the church fathers we find hardly anything concerning the distinguishing or the distinction 
between the law and gospel. So that's your second lecture. Sorry I got winded because I just did a reading of Luther's small catechism as well, part of my daily devotions. Um, but again, uh, online copy of this work will be in the uh, be in the description as well as uh, my link uh, or a link to one of my sites justifiedandcenter.blogspot.com justifiedandcenter.blogspot.com uh, I have a few articles up there uh, on justification, uh, inclusivism, things like that um, but uh, uh, hopefully we're going to get some, uh, some more stuff up there shortly Okay, happy Lord's Day to everyone.